What's up? Hey, David. How are you? Hey, man. Man, it's last time it was just you and me, but... I'm glad you're... he's here. He's way smarter than me, so... Yeah. He's, he's got the, the deep answer. theologian. Yeah. You're like the psalmist. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, yeah. let's go. Cool. What kind, of, what kind of parents do you have to be to raise kids like oh. you? I mean, tell us a little bit about your family dynamic just to yeah. get going. Yeah, just kick us off. Our, our parents, there's something about authenticity that you just, can't, you just can't substitute. My dad and mom, you know, I'm, we're pastor's kids, worship leader's kids. And so, yeah, and pastor's kids? All right, cool. Wow. I heard, heard some of you. Some of them had their hand up for the lost parent because they're pastor's yeah, kids. Yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh. So... So set PK syndrome aside, it was great. So our, our parents were the same people. Like it was a mega church in Southern California that my dad was a worship leader for. And he was the same guy um, leading worship for 20,000 as he was around the dinner table. Same guy. Um, and I really think that that was uh, a seed sown in me and in, in all of us and Phil too yeah. of what true kingdom service looks like um, and you can't replace that. Yeah, their, faith, their faithfulness just to serve and is a, for sure the bedrock of my, my faith, you know, just seeing it, it's just true. It's not like put on my church face and then come home and put on my, my annoyed at my kid face. You know, they were yeah. just, they were just lover, lovers of Jesus yeah. and I'm filled with the spirit. And uh, growing up in that, it just, it was never, never really has been a question of whether it's real or not. It's just like, how much am I going to trust, you know? Yeah. So you watch your mom and dad lead worship on stage, lead worship off stage. Yeah. It was never perfect, but it was a healthy yeah. relationship, yeah. I mean, dynamic growing up. You weren't the only two in, in the house. You have yeah. a little sister little as sister. well? Little Jill. Phil and Jill. Is she the theologian? Is she a Jillian. preacher? What, what is her gifting? She, yeah, she's a deep person. Uh, she prayer, like I would say gifted in prayer warrior-ness, whatever that is. Like she's like very a, insightful. Very, sensi a very sensitive, very sweet yeah. sensitivity, that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's great. So just, can, you, can you just kind of go further into like YouTube growing up? You were the older brother. Yeah. Uh, was he always just like this sweet little worship yeah. pastor? Or? No, for well, sure not. Yeah. But um, this yeah, is so why I'm, we're here. We want to hear a story. So right? I'm like just, just shy of three years older than Phil. And so like this story should sum up kind of the, dy the dynamic. Um, <laughs> so, like, Which one is this? Like Halloween. So like you're, you're trick-or-treating, you get a bunch of candy. And you're, you know, he's eight, I'm 11, and I'm the type of kid. Were you guys allowed to do Halloween? Because some of these PKs, they have to no, do like we Holy actually were. Ween or we, something. We super actually Christian. weren't allowed to do We're not allowed. We went to okay. Hallelujah Night. Hallelujah. There it is. Not Halloween Night, it was Hallelujah yeah. Night. It was Hallelujah Night. I had a night. student tell me they did Holy Ween. That's so bad. Yeah. So much generational sin they have to get over just for that. 100%. But, so no. you guys got to do Halloween. No, it was Hallelujah Night on the campus of our church. Hallelujah so Night, was, there it is. Which was actually amazing. I it was amazing. It. Set up was the Christian candy only the thing allowed? Like testaments, that's Christ all you got? Testaments, no, it was no, all no. the candies. But it was so, a lot of so he took all the candy and put it in his pillowcase and, and saved it for like ages. And like, I'm an anagram seven, I don't know if you know, like I'm up just like, I go crazy. So I ate all my candy October 31st. And then I woke up kind of sick. Gone at 8.32 p.m. October 31st. Yeah, and then I, so I woke up kind of sick, but I wanted some of his. I'm like, can I have some? He's like, 50 cents a sucker. And, uh, and I got mad at that. And because I got mad, he got would a actually. Little, I got a little three in me. That's he's, fine. He's like eight years old. Three. So he's eight years old, and I'm like, okay, fine, 50 cents. He's like, sorry, price just went up. I don't like your attitude. So <laughs> eight years that's old. That's not a three. That's mafia. That's oh, what that well. is. I don't make you a three. That's an unhealthy three, all right? I'm not, I didn't say it was healthy. Yeah. That's like a 666 six, six more than a three. Oh, you know no. What I'm oh, no. You can't, you can't sell your big brother candy, man. Like you got it the Holy I, Ween I or whatever. Say, the I praise that candy. or whatever. I saved that candy for TGI, watching Steve Urkel on TGIF. I saved that candy Friday nights. You guys don't even know who Steve Urkel is, huh? Family Matter? I would, go and, I would go and get out. I was so calculated. I would get like five pieces of candy and I'd watch one every, like every commercial break. I'd like eat it. I'd save it for Friday. So he wanted some candy. I'm like, this is my Friday night candy. Yeah. I'm like, you want it? 50 cents. He's like, what? I'm like, dollar. Did you pay for it? Planner. No, I would not pay. I'd steal it. <laughs> yeah. Your turn. Payback. You got a story? <laughs> um, I, just, I just remember lots of controllers being thrown in my face. Nintendo controllers. <laughs> And yes, um, Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Because Evan, yeah, Evan was always better than me at first, um, but I would just be like, man, I gotta beat him. And I would just, I would play, he'd be at school or something, I'd be like practicing Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Any Street Fighter fans out there? 
this is all before your time. Um, and then he'd get home, and I'd be like, beat him. And he'd be like, what the? and he'd throw controllers in my head. Yeah, Drew Blood. Brothers. Did you actually draw blood? Drew Blood. A... With the NES controller. Did you tell skill. your parents? Oh, yeah. yeah, immediately. I gave my parents a hard time. I was like the strong-willed kid. He just kind of, you know, he's, he's a three. He just kind of worked the system. And I was a middle kid, so I just kind of, I, I was more like, uh, I just figured it out on my own. I never really needed help with the schoolwork or anything. I just kind of did it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, just kind of made it happen. Yeah. Because yeah. my sister was like the youngest. She was the baby. He was the oldest. He got to do everything first. So I was like, I'll just, just figure it out. I'll figure yeah. it out then. Yeah. So, so was there <laughs> a moment, you, pretty, pretty typical sibling, you know, like just a lot of that kind of brotherly, just, yeah. uh, just messing around and growing up and video games. And it seems like you were in a pretty, not perfect, but healthy yeah. environment growing up. At what point did that relationship turn? Because I know you guys are dearest friends now. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. I think we're best friends. And uh, I think the relationship really did honestly turn. Before we were in high school together, he's freshman, I'm senior in high school, uh, we would commute. So to go to high school that year, 1995, 96, 96, 97, can't remember, but we would commute an hour. It was like a forced bro hang. Like, we together. It wasn't an hour. It was like 30 minutes in traffic there. Hour round trip. And, and we were together, just us, forced to like it, just be in each other's presence. Um, and at first it was awkward because our whole lives leading up to that was so much competition that we just would internalize and not verbalize. Uh, yeah. And it would fester. And he was just this annoying person, you know? <laughs> And, and, and then, so he's 14 and I'm 17 now. I, I just got my license, driving my freshman little brother. And, you know, I, I had a girlfriend at the time who's now my wife, which is awesome. By the way, she's here. They've been married 19 years, by the way. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. I'm glad she's here with us. Hopefully yeah. we'll introduce her tonight. Yeah. Yeah, so I would talk to Phil about my wife, Sandy, and we just, we just start, we just didn't even know we were going deep and actually doing important emotional health work um, because we were forced to be side by side, shotgun and driver's side. Yeah, I would say uh, at that point in our life, like, I had no idea what you were doing in your life. Same. And uh, we, we just, he, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I was in junior high. Same. I went to a different school. He was in high school at a different school. He had friends, I had friends. We just were, our lives had disconnected so much. You would stay out late. I, I just wasn't around. Then all of a sudden, we were going to the same high school. You were like 13. Yeah. And then so when I walk, got in, uh, I mean, I felt, I, my brother was driving me to school. Like I, even though I didn't let him know, I mean, I was pumped. Like, I felt so cool in that car, you know? And then he would start playing. He's like, and then I remember like as the weeks went on, I was like, check out this, this new record. It's, called, it's a band called Delirious, you know? Yeah. It's a worship band from, from the UK. I'm like, this is awesome. And I was starting to lead worship at the time. He was like already an accomplished musician. And like, so I wouldn't, like, let him know. I'm like, this is awesome, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, same. I mean, I really do, like, look back at that, that year as, as pivotal. And I know that, you know, time with your siblings isn't always, it doesn't always end well. Um, but I think the repetition and the forced communication, <laughs> forced communication, and then, and then him weighing in on my relationship with my girlfriend at the time as a little teenager. How does it look? What do you think about relationships? It ended up, it ended up well. It ended up being a really, a really good moment. I think the Holy Spirit was involved. Yeah. And so now, I mean, you guys do a lot of life together, and you're, you're just as much a great as uncle can. to, you know, each other's kids. And, um, but a lot of our students hear this, and this is a, a reoccurring thing in this series that we've been in, where they, we talk about marriage, and uh, a lot of times our guests will come and prop up their marriage as, a, as an illustration, and it's a really healthy one. Or we'll talk about some other dynamic, and, and this as well. We, we talk about you know, good kids growing up in a good home that weren't perfect, but then in their teenage years really forged this relationship, healthy brotherly affection. Yeah. But a lot of our students had the very opposite. The car ride was very toxic or the relationship was hijacked by a brother who went rogue or a sister who went prodigal. So what advice would you give to someone who grew up in a, an environment that was very different from that? Because yeah. you pastor people yeah. who went through a very different path. You sing songs over people and lead worship with people and pastor people who went through something different. So coming out of a healthy relationship, yeah. what advice would you give to someone who's coming today to this moment and their definition of sibling yeah. is something very dangerous yeah. maybe? Yeah. Wanna go first? Yeah, so 
I, I, I would say to start, starting with Jesus is good. And in, in Matthew 12, Jesus' brothers, his siblings, were knocking on the door thinking he was nuts. And his mother and his brothers were there saying, our, our, you know, our son, our sibling is off his rocker. We got to bring him home and straighten him out. And Jesus did something that was extremely provocative. And I would even say, like, just as scandalous in that day as it would be now. And he actually redefines family. He turns the notion of family on its head. And with his parents within earshot, because houses were really tiny back then, with his parents in earshot, he's like, they're like, hey, your, your mother and brothers are here. And he's like, who are my mother and brothers? Yeah. He just like throws that question out there. Um, it's like a mic drop. Who are, who, who's at the door? I don't even know them, almost. And, and, he, and he points to the people seated at his feet to learn as disciples. And he says, those that do my father's will are my mother and my sisters and my brothers. Jesus actually redefines family, no longer primarily by blood, but by faith. This is ecclesiology. This is how to rightly think about what the church is. This is why it's so important for us to actually have a rooted, integrated life with your church family. Because when your church family is your first family, I really think only then can you re-enter the matrix, which is sometimes toxic, the matrix of your blood family in a healthy way for like, and actually be an agent of change. And actually have the boldness and the identity um, wherewithal as Christ's son related to your church to come into your maybe toxic family as a, a missionary from the kingdom and to have the hard conversations like, hey, I think that it's weird when we're together, don't you? Like imagine having that conversation like face to face with the brother or sister or mother or father that it's weird with. Like oh, I, I really think that, that that like boldness can only come from rightly orienting yourself in the family of faith. The first family Jesus says is primarily family. Because um, then your blood family will only benefit. Heaven will invade it. Um, I've seen it happen. Awesome. Amen. Yeah. Man, I think, I think just that might be the, the biggest thing, sentence or thought that some of our students needed to hear this entire semester. Hmm. That God is calling them back into their family as a missionary. And that there will be a day where he will no longer be your brother. For Jason, who just lost his mom and his dad. Like, there will be a day when they're no longer his mom and his dad. But forever, his mom is ultimately his sister in Christ. His dad is ultimately, eternally, his brother in Christ. Phil is eternally your brother in Christ. Yeah. And so when you see things as the long play, then you have a different perspective as you get in. But can you get practical with us um, if someone has a relationship where the boundaries have been imposed? You know what I mean? So it's not like just fun and games and someone's like getting your Halloween candy, man. It's like I I'm in a very different kind of relationship where I'm, I feel like I'm enabling more than equipping a mm -hmm. sibling. Give us some advice on how someone can navigate through that, get back in it without being in an abusive situation, yeah. possibly. Wow. Yeah, again, it starts with uh, accepting Jesus' definition of true family yeah. as family defined by faith. And so this is why well, you guys had one of my other best friends ever uh, come speak here last month. His name's John Mark Homer. Yeah. So uh, he, he and I go way back, and I, and I heard what he said here. Uh, his, his thing on community is so important. It's not his thing. It's literally a historic teaching of the church. The church as family is the antidote to so much emotional unhealth in our bio families. It really is. And so for me, I mean, you know, he's, I'm a musician, he's a musician, and I'll just say it. How, uh, what would it feel like to you if your little sibling was a hundred times more influential to you in your chosen field of influence? Like you would have identity issues to work out. Where are you gonna work them out? Like first here? Maybe not. With your elders at your church, with your trusted community, with those that you actually call spirit, faith, family? That's, that's the only way to like get your, like which way is up? <laughs> where am I mind reading him? Where, where do I think he's mind reading me? And where's the unhealth? Your spiritual family can help you diagnose that. 
And the antidote is the Spirit's empowered presence through the family of faith, um, giving you wisdom and guidance so that you can re-enter this matrix and be like, hey, and then you can, Pete Scazzaro has this great like tool, like we can go to, with boldness, grounded in your identity in Christ through the church, you can be like, I think that you think I'm weird. Is that true? Like you can actually get rid of mind reading because that's, that's why this all, this all starts with mind reading. We don't have the guts or the tools to deal with mind reading that we're always doing. So like, Phil, I think that you think that I'm weird in some way. Is that true? And you can be like, oh my gosh, no, I think that you think I'm weird or whatever. Um, and it takes so much guts to do that, but I think those guts come from the Holy Spirit um, within the context of your true family, the church. So, so talk about worship and the role that plays maybe in someone here who deals with a very broken home. Yeah. And so the ideas of father and the ideas of brother and the ideas of family just conjure up a very different emotion. Yeah. Uh, I, I often say that on stage, you know, I think because sometimes I feel like I need to do it myself. It's like, you know, let, let your mouth preach to your soul right now as, as we sing out in faith. You know, so much of what we do in the worship is remembering who God is so we can respond to him. And a lot of what we do is, is we kind of sing it into our own futures. You know what I mean? Like, um, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I feel you're working, you're the way yeah. maker. You, yeah. you, and and maybe, maybe, maybe you could be like, well, are you God? Like, I'm, I've been asking for a way through this or through that or for you to bring a miracle into this or that for years, you know? And, uh, and to, instead of like singing into the present, like, well, I'm, I'm, singing, I'm singing with faith into the future of who you are. The end goal in you, Jesus, is this. And I'm singing in, into my future and over my life that you're a good, good father, you know? And, and so I'm singing, I'm singing those words of healing into my life, you know? And it's, it's pretty amazing as you're like something very, very powerful. I mean, we just experienced here and God even gives us a special promises when the family of God, when the people of God sing the praise of God in the presence of God, to coin the Matt Redman phrase that I heard him say a lot. Um, there's just some, a, a special spiritual thing that happens. And so in, in the context of the family of God, singing out God's character over your life, there's, there's true, true healing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not just like a, it's not just the brainwashing thing at all. It's a, it's a, it's a you're letting your, your, your physical body preach to your spiritual self and, uh, and true healing happens. So, I mean, we, we wanted to introduce this idea, but uh, honestly, uh, having seen a little bit of what God's put on your heart for tonight, yeah. Evan, and knowing where we're about to go, and it goes so much further than the sibling dynamic it, and, or the family dynamic, it just goes into every relationship that you have in this world. Um, don't give the whole thing away, but give yeah. us a little thought, especially, again, someone who's transparent enough to say, Man, like last night, my brother wins a Dove Award yeah. for song. You know, come and, on. And, and, uh, he won a and Dove last night. Every time, every time he like puts out an album, instantly becomes massively successful. Yeah. You've you've had your run in music, and and, yeah. and a very different definition of what success looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you just celebrate him as like this great theologian and this amazing pastor. But tonight, what what can we expect? Because we're going to go take this a lot further tonight. Uh, but give us a little more insight. Yeah, um, yeah tonight we're going to talk about unhealthy comparison. Nobody struggles with that. <laughs> None of you. Uh, and unhealthy comparison, really the problem is envy. And envy drives... Uh, uh, Consciously and subconsciously, envy drives so many of our daily decisions. Um, and there's this cycle of crazy that we get into that I'm going to talk about, where uh, it's actually in one of Jesus' parables. I won't tell you which one. But uh, Jesus talks about these people who begin with calculation, like, how much do they have? How little do I have? And, and then it moves into complaining, where they actually bring other people into their misery. And then that gives birth to a competitive, an unhealthy competitive spirit, and it goes back to calculating. And that will ruin our relationship with God and our relationship with our community of faith, almost more than anything else, because it perverts our view of reality. We have these incredibly powerful, heavenly uh, ordained things called words that create power. So God speaks and light happens, uh, and the authors of the New Testament talk about God, at God's word, the universe is rightly ordered. And then God speaks and makes you. And we are in his image. We're different from animals in a few important ways. 
One of which is we use language to create perceptions of reality. We speak, and we can actually cause other people to see reality in a perverse way or in a true way. And it really is rooted in this like toxic addiction to envy. It's really like an illness, and Jesus offers the cure to envy. So we're gonna talk about that cure. We're gonna diagnose the illness, talk about the cure tonight. I, not the band, the cure. That sounded awesome almost, but Very we're gonna talk about the cure to envy. And I really pray that the Holy Spirit actually uproots yeah. roots of bitterness. The, the ancient biblical authors call them roots of bitterness that actually grow in us, which sounds so gross. Um, and it's, it is gross. It's meant to sound gross. And Jesus wants to like surgically remove those to deposit heaven in your homes. So, Yeah, I think tonight's going to be, again, one of those nights where from the songs that we've selected for the night to the, the word that God's put on, you know, Pastor Evan's heart, it's going to be one of those nights that's going to be um, very pivotal and a crossroad for a lot of you. Uh, I think God's going to do a lot of healing in your life and prepare you for what God wants to do during Christmas break. Uh, we, on our way out, want to, since we had two siblings and we've been blessing different dorms, play this four-minute game that we have in store for you. Where are, the, where are the people from the South Tower? Where are the ladies of the South Tower? There it is. Will you scream again just one more time? Where are you at? Scream again. South Tower, let me hear you. Cool. So, obviously, as you just heard, that's an all-female dorm for anyone else who's visiting today and doesn't know. So since we have brothers here, we're going to play a game called Brotherly Love, the South Tower Edition. And if we get enough points, we have for all of you a, a, a real big prize, all right? So we're going to play this. It's going to be the, the, the Wickhams against the Nassers. I've asked my brother Benjamin to come join me. And so here we go. Are you all ready? Hey, Twins, Look come out. Tell them the rules. All right, everybody, it's time to play Brothers Keeper. It's the game where brothers will work together to decode secret messages to score points. Today, our team of brothers will be Ben and David Nasser versus Phil and Evan Wickham. That's right, and one brother will wear noise-canceling headphones to, in order to have three tries to guess the secret message the other brother is trying to communicate to them. If, by the end of the game, the Wickhams have outscored the Nasser, then the girls of Liberty South Tower are all coming home with a Twix, the brother's keeper of candy. That's right, it looks like our contestants are about ready to play, so let's begin the game and play brother's keeper. All right, guys, you guys feeling ready? Ready. All right, all right, Phil, Phil, are you ready? I know, I don't have the music yet. You, okay, Phil, hey, we need music in the head. Okay, Phil, can you hear me? Phil? The music me? is coming Okay, in yeah, he, he can't hear me. All right, all right, here we go. Evan, you're gonna start on my mark. Here we go, Wait, ready? The, the music is coming in and out. Okay, all right, is it in? Right, can you hear me? It's in I don't, now. I don't go. think it can hear me. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, go. Liberty Worship Collective. Liberty Worship Collective. <laughs> Pumpkin Spice Latte. The, the music keeps going in and out. I heard that one. Oh, I, I got to be honest. Okay. <laughs> Come on. Let's start the clock back over. Start the clock back over. All right. All right, here we go. Here we go. Okay. One more time. Here we go. From the beginning? We're, yeah, we're going to start from the beginning. Restart okay. the scoreboard. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Liberty Worship Collective. You Liberty Worship All Collective. Right. All right, here you go. Here's Pumpkin Spice Latte. Pumpkin Spice Latte. All right. San Diego, California. Something California. San Diego. San Diego, California. Stranger Things Season 4. Greater Things Season 4. Stranger Things Stranger Season Things 4. Stranger Things Season 4. Eight seconds left. Coffee creamer. Coffee river. Coffee creamer. Coffee river. Creamer. Creamer. Coffee creamer. Coffee creamer. That's it. That's it. Five points. Five points for the Wickhams. That's a good score, guys. You guys can make your way out of the out of the place. Here we go. All right. Uh, ben will be wearing the headphones. All right, David. Here are your questions. Ben, can you hear me? Fantastic. All right, guys, here we go. In three, two, one. Brotherly love. Brotherly love. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're, ta if you're taking notes. I don't know. If you're taking notes. You can pass. Write this down. Write this down. Write this down, yes, good enough. He's the boss, so. Jerry 
shirtless in convo. All right, and that's time. That's time. You guys are gonna have to do better oh, next round. Harder than this. You're gonna have to do better next Dude, round. Only two come points. On. Come on, Ben. Ours are a lot harder. <laughs> All right, Evan, you're wearing the headphones this time. This Evan, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear anything? Can't hear anything. Awesome. All right, Phil, you're up. We're gonna get started here in just a second. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Your love awakens me. Your love awakens me. Woo! Uh, Cain and Abel. He is Abel? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Yeah. You're adopted. You're adopted? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a better musician. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a better musician. Sorry. I'm... I'm a... Better... Better... Mu I'm a better musician. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And that's it. That's time. Good job, guys. Nine points. That's a good score. That's a good score. All right, guys. Let's get situated again here. David's got the headphones on. David, can you hear me? I can't hear a thing. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. All right. You ready? Yeah, All right, yeah. you're gonna read that one first. Okay, is this here Kanye? we go. That is, I Kanye think it is, is Kanye. Here in combo, everybody. Kanye, is that combo? All right, ready? Three, two, one, go. I'm Dad's favorite. I'm Dad's favorite. That's right. Next one. A brother is born for a time of adversity. Hey, brother, there's a bowl of fruit. No, a brother is born for a time of adversity. Hey, brother, it's born 4th of July. Liberty smells like manure. Liberty what? Smells like manure. Liberty smells like Mandarin? Manure. Cow poop. Huh? Cow poop. All right, cow everybody, poop. That's Liberty time. smells like cow poop. The girls of the South Tower have won. Congratulations, you guys. You get Twix after campus community tonight. Uh, you guys are dismissed. We'll see you tonight at Campus Community. See you tonight.